All right. So thank you guys for making it through lunch. <laughs> um, if in your wanderings you get up and you realize there's still food out there, we have to go containers for everything. This is going to be as zero waste as possible, zero food waste, no pl as little plastic as possible. So please take uh, a snack for later or dinner. Um, and feel free, that's why we put everything out there. All right, so to get started, um, as you remember, we kind of talked about this morning where plastic is in our environment. And so I'm going to open up to all of you. Does anyone have any questions for anyone sitting here? Uh, Liz, I saw Liz. Yeah. Uh, you said that very small plastic could not get recycled. Do that food nips, which is very threatening based on some of the other photos we saw? Yeah, so uh, this would, depending on the size of them, you know, kind of the general state of the gap we've got there, if it's, you know, smaller than two inches by two inches, it's likely not going to be probably still in your system. This is a question for uh, both well, anyone on the panel that would be that person in Martin. So, um, you know, if you've got a class of all people with like campus environments, like you have the water volumes and University of Great Islands, you're the link here. What's the kind of key advice you can give to these universities for the most members of the person to help your kind of like industry? <laughs> Something like we have power or something to do something about the trash. But I think that one of the biggest issues is like 
a lack of infrastructure, especially in, in a lot of coastal access points where there are no trash cans. So people don't take the trash with them. They don't leave the trash behind. They'll put it in a bag or something and pile it all up at the entrance. And you can show up to some of those sites that the trash is there, but then a little bit of wind comes and then it makes it all into the water. So I feel like how do we address that problem of like infrastructure along coastal points that are, like that infrastructure is not there? And I think telling people to take their trash out is obviously not cutting it. So like I feel like how do we address that problem of like um, lessening the amount of trash that is left behind on those sites? <coughs> I don't know if that makes sense or not. Okay, one thing um, I had to kind of mention briefly at the end of the presentation was Yeah. 
question is, so um, when the sanitation vehicle comes to our materials recycling facility, it gets tipped down onto the tip floor and we inspect that load. If the load is too highly contaminated with items, we'll do one of two things. We'll either try to like, you know, segregate the portion that's highly contaminated and put the rest of the recyclables through our sorting machines, or we'll have to reject the entire load, and that would have to load then to sound the okay. yeah. All right, we have time for like one to two more questions. Moving around. 
um, the information that I have from San Francisco Bay. It's the very worst city we I would say Rhode Island, now that the Bay, is vastly more studied than most places around the world. We have a unique opportunity here with an extremely data rich area to really start to look at some of the dynamics about how particles are moving around in our waters. So, now that the Bay, fantastically studied system. We've had huge projects for multiple years, like the CA and Export Program, which has turned millions of dollars into research and development and extensive science about the physics of the bed. So we have really good computer simulations of how water move around, how plankton are interacting with the environment. It's extremely data dense in terms of physical observation, and it's incredibly readily accessible from small boats from a variety of areas. Think about the coastal universities around the state. We have Roger Williams. You don't have to look out the window. We're right there. We can see the water of the bed. From URI, we can see the water can access it. There's a lot of research intensity going on in the bed. We also have a unique socioeconomic system, particularly with population density, where we can see this graduation. If you just look at my slide there, you can see the higher intensity of human population in the north, and it softens as we go to the south. We have wastewater treatment facilities dotted around the state. We have major inputs of fresh water towards the northern part. We have predominantly saline gradient as we go further towards the open map. So it's a, it's a very interesting study set. It gives us a unique opportunity to look at how humans practice the environment all the time. <coughs> we also have that unique opportunity when it comes to engaged stakeholders and an informed population. Rhode Island, you have to we have a lot of people that are very, very interested in the environmental areas, the environmental challenges that are faced around the world. And we also have extremely engaged stakeholders, many of whom have spoken today. So the best, clean up and access, clean water action. Okay, there's many of them. We have a lot of researchers, a lot of extremely talented people working on plastic problems. URI recently resubmitted their NSF Expo proposal which is focused predominantly on plastic particles. We hope that we will be successful. We'll find out about that November March, and I'm sure Richard Faber will talk more about how URI is trying to help Rhode Island address the uh, plastic pollution challenges. So I am just the tip of the iceberg when I talk about the research that we're doing at Rhode Island. It is diverse, it is vast, it is across the whole spectrum. I'm going to talk to you about plastic particles. So, in this aspect, we're focusing on one aspect of the research group that Clean and I probably, and that is looking at what plastic particles are in our bank of the marine system. We've also tried and started to um, quantify fresh water uh, microplastics. We try to look at the inputs coming into the bay, and Colleen later on will address item number three on my side here, which is talking about environmental impact in terms of organismal impact. So, well, this is not going to be, these are our predominant areas. I'm showing you our uh, Manticore survey stats. So we use this method of, that Scott presented, the Manticore surface crawler, to try and enumerate samples. We have six regular sampling sites. We've done multiple years and multiple seasons. We've done high frequency sampling of an entire tidal cycle to get tidal dynamics and how that influences microplastic abundances. From that data, we decided we're going to pick extremely consistent time periods when we sample that are driven by the tidal cycle. This is one thing that people still do not really take into account when they take the survey. The tide is a massive driver of the quantity of plastic uh, particles. <coughs> so, our massive growth survey, we established it several years ago. We've maintained it since and kept it consistent. We have uh, sites to the north, and then we come down the east and west passages of the bay, six sites in total. And as Scott said, it takes a long time to work with it. Okay? We also face challenges doing this kind of that. Okay? The bay in some areas freezes up, and sometimes we can't even get our boat in the water during the winter. My students frequently complain, I say to the type of students work in the water, students do for me. Okay? <laughs> complain about the water freezing as they're trying to clean the net, and the challenges that they face to try and do a full year worth of time. And it's important that we look at the whole temporal cycle, not just the seven when it's beautiful and everybody wants to be on a boat. Okay, so we always have to look at different time points. If we're going to try and fully decouple the physical dynamics of the system, 
and what's going on in terms of practice. So this here is our beautiful truck from University of Rhode Island, put in our small order now. You can see the, uh, the uh, CI set. We use a surface mount tool, a highly selective sampling tool, I would admit. You know, that's very much understandable. Uh, fibers, but it also understandable the different types of patterns. So heavier on denser particles and not sampled by a mount tool, the predominantly sent out very rapidly where they're, they're from the source of origin. We also undertake a huge amount of actual sampling, not just for the particles themselves, but also to see what level of contamination we ourselves are adding into our sample. So it's structured from that interlaboratory, interlaboratory, interlaboratory comparison that some people were overestimating the amount relative to the bad concentration. And that's very common, okay? That people will inject uh, plastics into that sample. So we try to provide a robust approach that <coughs> minimizes contam contamination but also quantifies it as well. So we know exactly what's happening to our sample. I'm not going to understand this is incredibly difficult research. Trying to identify plastic particles from the myriad, the matrix of organic, inorganic stuff that is in the water is very difficult, okay? It gets exponentially harder the smaller the particle size you get. Our techniques are still relatively stone age, okay? We're still relying a lot on sieving. We're still relying a lot on manual picking and manual identification. Technology, as people have said today, needs to catch up with the research aspirations that we have if we're going to try and do uh, longer term and more intensive sampling over time. So what we do in our lab is we get the sample, we sieve it, we just separate climate plastic flow out of all of the impact. We want to get a relatively clean sample, make life a lot easier down there. The students then spend an enormous amount of time in front of the microscope trying to find particles and pick them out, and then they stick them onto a grid. So this grid here, we double-sided sticky tape, a very expensive double-sided sticky tape. <laughs> they stick all of the particles onto it so that we have this grid system. And then we're very lucky that the University of Rhode Island uh, gave us the money to buy the automated scanning microscope that scans in multiple wavelengths of light <coughs> at the time. So we can get a really good, high-quality digital image of all the particles. That first slide we saw with the blue particles is an example of the image quality we got. So our, my, our grading system is really good because it allows us to track every individual particle we collect. So we can track it all the way through our analysis pipeline. So we can detect and definitely determine the plastic. We can also determine what its composition is. We can measure it, we can enumerate the size, color, and shape, and so on. Once we've done this, we then take two processes. We, uh, we needle test it by melting it with a sobering iron. If it melts, it's probably plastic. If it doesn't, it's probably organic material or some other thing. It burns. And then we blast the laser beam at it through the RAM spectroscope to try and tell us what the plastic composition is. So we do this for every single particle we collect by mass. We also developed, Scott also showed a pump filter system. But the pump filter system that Scott showed is a commercially available model that you can buy from a company, it's very expensive. I made mine out of bits of parts I got from Home Depot and online from several various shops. I decided that we wanted to build a pump system that would allow us to sample plastic particles down to 10 microns in that. So we have a size fractionation system. This is fully open source. You can download the design, all of the operating procedures, everything from GitHub, and from here be available for you to take. Okay, our 3D printed parts we use, made out of PLA, by the way, are all, which is a biodegradable-ish plastic, and um, it's all available to that. And we use these cartridge filters that are commercially available. So they're readily available to buy them off the shelf, and we can go with size vaccination from 280 microns and larger. We have an intermediate size range of about 100 to 280, and then down to 10, so 10 to about 100 microns. We subtract the size fraction our sample too. Those processes take even longer. So when you imagine that it's fairly easy to work with a larger plastic particle, 
the mantle throughout of the red is at 330 microns in effect. The so 0.3 of a millimeter in depth. Okay? The value is you can kind of see with the naked eye and with the dissecting microscope, it's very easy. It's a, a lot of people can do that size. Okay? It's really about time and practice. When we start getting smaller and smaller and smaller, it becomes technologically limited, but it also becomes extremely specific skill set because we have to be able to try and separate out that noisy matrix of other particles from what we are really looking for. That is the biggest technological challenge for plastic research in the world, is how do we go from one cubic meter of water to a sample of plastic particles that we can readily image and quantify. It's a huge challenge. I'm talking purely about surface water here, not about sediment. Okay, okay, we'll talk about sediment today. So this here is what we end up with, okay? This slide here with the dirty, okay? It's not what most people would love to see, it's just plastic particles dotted on there. I would love to see that, but that's not what we get. We still get a very lot of noise in there. We stain it, we try and make it easier to come see the particles, and this is what it looks like. So there's a lot of stuff on there. They're extremely small, difficult to work with. So that's when we start to subsample. So this tape slide here that we show on this side here is just trying to strip out all of the other stuff that we need to work intensively on mapping that small area and then blasting everything with the laser beam. So here is our student that's there, there dressed in that rather fetching orange colour. Okay? Now we don't just make her wear orange because we're horrible professors. <laughs> right? Or because the lab coat is very cheap. Okay? It's a cotton lab coat. No Latin cotton, okay? No polyester blends in it. <laughs> and we make it wear orange because orange is actually a rare colour in our hands. So if we get contamination from the lab coat or from orange, we know that it probably comes from our test. So our students wear orange at all stages through the process, from sampling on the boat through to in the laboratory. We have a photo suit, lab coat, and everything is this orange colour. We spend a lot of time, and we spend many years developing contamination control methods in order to try and figure out just how much external contamination is coming in. It's extremely important. I cannot overvalue that. We have to filter everything because early days, you start seeing all of these fragments and stuff. They're in our reagents. I mean, there's microplastics in our reagents, and it just mind-boggling to think that way. But then again, it's in our tap water. Okay. And then we use up to pure water to try and keep it down. We use these uh, laminar fluid flow heads because we can't make a clean room in our lab because right, you are our lab is old. We really do try to buy a new clean room. It's like four million dollars. It's extremely expensive. But that herd is like two thousand we can afford that. So you want to try and keep your contamination low. We do a huge amount of spiking. And that's something you heard about today, is we inject particles into our workflow intentionally to try and see how many do we get back. Okay, back to the efficiency measures. If you are a student or you're a professor thinking about getting into plastic research, this is no longer something that you should do, it's something you must do. You need to know where the fallacies are in your methodology. If you are going to stay, this is how many plastic particles are in the water. Because we need to be able to extrapolate, interpolate, and try and build that full picture. We spike everything. We spike the mantle truck. We spike the pump filter system. We spike our sample. We throw beads at things just to see how many particles we can get back. And you'd be surprised. When we first start, our students start around 30% recovery rate. Extremely low. By the time it's finished, going through multiple iterations of these uh, kind of uh, tests and practice, they end up with 90%. Our target in our lab is to achieve a 90% extraction efficiency across the size range from 10 microns all the way up to fibers at 300 microns per. So we look at this in intense detail. We spent a huge amount of time doing this uh, because we want to produce the best data. So this has been four years of work to try and get to this point. So it's not that easy. Uh, so here is some of our preliminary data. 
of our map across Africa, across the North and South Gradient, and map is that when deleted the second because I forgot to remove the animation. But on the left hand side of the X axis there is the northern side, and as we go down to the south, so you can see a rough approximation of a gradient of plastic particle contamination. Okay? It's two years of sampling. I'm just going to delete that. I'm sorry, I forgot. I don't even know. Hey, well, let me delete it. I'm guessing I am. Uh, oh, there we go. Somebody pirated this version of that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go away. Uh, so, I've got a bit of So we see this kind of concentration grade. We have different seasons in there. We are still working on adding in the final year's worth of data and doing some more um, work on this, but you can see the high level of variation. Okay, there's a lot of variation going on, particularly in the north. And then uh, west of Hog Island, you know, not too far away from where we are, quite a lot of uh, pollution coming out of uh, Mount Cook Bay there. So there's, there's a lot of pollution. Northern part, fairly condensed, and as we go down the south, it gets less and less. These are some of the pictures of the particles we've taken over the years. Uh, polypropylene, uh, blue fragment, yeah, polyethylene, small film or small fragment. And then we'll pull it down as well. Found lots of different stuff. These uh, pictures are just fairly, you know, incredible. Really, we're going to um, So we've recovered a lot of particles across time. My students have identified 2,000 particles. We see a lot of sampling for fragments. Of course, we are under sampling here. But we're also under sampling in terms of quantum attacks. The heavier particles we don't capture in the surface sample. So that's something to keep in mind when you think about these numbers. Is we're really only sampling a very small uh, portion of what we can yeah, see. Okay? And you can see some orange in here as well. You know, that's probably from us. Okay? Remove it from uh, the analysis later on. So these here are just some examples of the particles we've collected. We do collect um, fibers in our manifold, sure, but a very low proportion. That number really should be flipped upside down. We find a lot more fibers than every other particle type. But it's just an artifact of the time we You see lots of different parts. Okay. So these are all particles collected from our galaxy bed. Okay. So there are lots of different colors. We see lots of different pieces of plastic, lots of different types. We also see predominantly less dense floating plastic, like polyethylene, in high numbers. Okay. You know, polyester, if a plastic shot out now and stuff like we don't see too much of that. So when we look at the bay, what does it mean in comparison to other studies around the world? And these are just studies that we've just started to do a literature search to kind of pull out different uh, <coughs> researchers that are using similar methodologies to ours. We see that we're not too far off of a you know? We're not extremely dirty like many other extremely industrialized areas. We're actually relatively clean when you look at the average gradient. We're in the north, definitely there's a lot of so thank you very much for listening. So Green Tucker will be talking about organismo work at weather. Our work has been funded by a huge variety of different agencies, but if you want to give us money to do this, please do. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you my bank account number at the end of this. Yeah. Um, and then continue to support Patrick Brewster. It has been a challenge to gather, gather funding for this kind of booster. It's starting to change now. But out of 10, 20, Programs that have failed, two have been funded. Not a great success rate. So we want to see more support for this. So particularly people, stakeholders, please do contact researchers, get involved, so that we can start to try and make a better case for funding. Okay, thank you very much. So next, I'm actually going to bring up uh, Dr. K. Ho. So she comes from us from the United States EPA, and she's an environmental researcher there, right here in our handset. So for those of you who might not know, yes, we have an EPA office right across the bed. Uh, she's a subject matter expert on microplastic research, and it's part. This is actually part of more of an emerging contaminant research suite that takes place over there. So anything that falls underneath of that contaminant block, so the PFAS, PFO, all the fancy more buzzwords that we have uh, when we talk to pharmaceuticals, this lab has been really on the forefront of understanding how to find these things and what
what really great methodologies are. So I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Ho to come up, talk about her research at EPA, and how we're, you know, what's next on the EPA in terms of making sure that we have these massive amounts of methodologies available. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you for inviting uh, me here to talk to today about microplastic research at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, this is really a group effort, and we have a number of people from our lab here uh, in, in the audience today. So uh, Michaela and Troy are on, and Marissa are all here, so you can always ask them questions afterwards, too. So pushing this button. Yeah, there we go. Um, so actually, let me just flip back for a second. And I'd just like to say that I'd like to kind of start with this, um, these two magazine covers, because to me, they really illustrate that the plastics problem has caught the attention of both the popular and the scientific communities. Um, uh, microplastics are everywhere. Uh, they are ubiquitous. Everywhere people have looked for them, they have found them, especially even in humans. And they're, they are increasing. Uh, with the increase in plastic production that we have and are decreasing in recycling rates, uh, the, these, these particles will be with us for a long time. Even if we are able to stem the flow of microplastics or plastics into the environment, the, um, the tons of microplastics that exist in the environment will not go away. They, they are persistent. Um, so with that, let me switch to the next one. So I'd like to start with the definition of microplastics. So at least for the next 20 minutes or so, we are all thinking about the same thing when we say the word microplastic. And uh, like the California definition, we, we define microplastics as plastic particles that range from uh, five millimeters to one nanometer. Um, in addition to what, uh, what Scott was saying that, so this is a huge range in sizes. So five millimeters is about that big. You can see at the end of a pencil eraser, you can manipulate it. And one nanometer, you need a good scanning electron microscope to be able to see, and special techniques really to manipulate. So in addition to this wide range of sizes, as Scott said before, um, microplastics and plastics are a huge, di uh, diverse group of, of, of uh, substances. There's different particles, there's different polymers, they have different properties, they're designed to be different, they move through the environment differently. And then on top of it, we also he also talked about additives, right? So um, plastics are rarely put out into the environment as virgin plastics, they have all types of additives, plasticizers, um, UV inhibitors, things to make them harder, softer, metals, uh, fragrances, colors, all of these end up in plastics. And the reason why we care about this so much is that when you're trying to develop a method to extract and identify this very diverse group of compounds, so clearly not one method is going to do it. You're going to have to use a number of different methods to, to look at these, this very diverse group. So with that kind of scary definition of microplastics, um, our uh, objective for the last th three years or so has been to standardize the extraction, identification, and quantification methods for microplastics and sediments and surface waters. Um, so, the, the, like, I was listening to Andrew and he was saying how complex it is to look at microplastics in water, but when you try and look at them in sediments, it kind of like triples that complexity. And the question is, why would you even bother to look for them in sediments? Because we believe that when microplastics get into aquatic systems, there's a, a ton of biofouling occurs, and then there's aggregation, and they get biofouled and more aggregated, and eventually they all sink to the bottom. It's estimated that about 70% of all microplastics end up in sediments. So the sediments serve as sinks, and then also possibly sources during resuspension events. Um, there's been demonstrated effects to uh, benthic organisms and communities uh, due to microplastics. And if the benthic organisms and communities are affected, eventually the inquire, inqui entire aquatic system would become affected. And there are many challenges for microplastics. So the sediment matrix is really a lot of par particulate minerals that kind of like to pretend that they're microplastics, but they aren't really. So when you're looking at them, they can kind of look that way. In addition, um, sediment has a lot of carbon in it. So you're looking for, and plastics are also carbon. So you're looking for a little bit of plastic in a matrix with a ton of plastic and then things that are pretending to be plastic. So it's, it's kind of challenging. Um, but I'll talk about some of the test cases that we've done with some US EPA regional sediments and then some of our method development. And I'll start with that first. 
Um, oops, let me go back again, sorry. Um, so the US EPA regional set of set sediments uh, were done in regions one, two, three, and nine, and this is a map of the, um, where those regions are. So they tend to be the coastal regions in the Northeast and then also California. Do I have a pointer on this? Do you know? So, so um, I'd like to start with some of the quantification and comparison of sediment extraction methods that were done in our laboratory, and Michaela Cashman uh, headed up a lot of this. In terms of background, uh, many different methods exist for, um, for sediment comparison and extraction. Um, so we like to sometimes joke and say that about 75 different researchers work on sediments and microplastics, so there are 75 different methods because everyone does it just a little bit differently. So the upshot of that is when you try and compare the results among the different methods, it's often not very meaningful. So what Michaela did was to assess five of the commonly used methods in the literature for the extraction and isolation of microplastics using two different sediments, a sandy sediment and a silty sediment, and then four different plastic types, different densities, different shapes, and different sizes. Uh, she spiked the microplastics into the sediments, extracted into the two different types of sediments, extracted each using um, each of the five different methods, and then quantified the results. So based on our initial findings, we uh, developed also a hybrid method, and I'll jump right to these, um, to the results. So on the y-axis here is percent recovery, uh, whoops, that's not going to work, let me go back. Go. Um, I guess it doesn't judge. So on the y-axis is um, percent recovery of uh, sand along the top uh, row and silt along the bottom row, ranging from zero to 100%. On the x-axis um, are the four uh, uh, plastics that were spiked in, a polyvinyl chloride flake, a polyethylene, a polyethylene sphere, a polyethylene terphthalate fiber, and a polypropylene fragment. Um, the the letters along the x-axis are the first initial of the primary investigator's uh, uh, last name, <laughs> and H stands for the hybrid method. You can see um, the, the methods that were tested are in TAN, and none of the existing methods consistently extracted greater than 70% of each microplastic. The ones that did have a little gold star on them. The sediment, the microplastic, and the extraction method all affected the percent recovery. The hybrid method in green generally did extract greater than 70% from both sediments and most microplastics. So I'll talk a little bit about the hybrid method, but I won't kill you with all the details. For people who aren't familiar with how uh, sediments are extracted uh, from microplastics or microplastics using um, most methods, including this one, started off, starts off with a, sieve, a sieving separation. So you have to separate them into size classes. Um, so the, we have two size classes, and then we did a density separation uh, using sodium bromide at 1.3 and 1.5 grams per cubic centimeter. Um, and then the filters that came from those uh, separatory funnels were oxidized. We did it with four filters and uh, identified the particles using Raman spectroscopy. Uh, we worked this with the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project for method evaluation of, of this method, and uh, Troy Lagnet, who's here in the audience, also just submitted this to Chemosphere, so we're, we're, we have high hopes. Um, so uh, in addition, we use this with some regional sediments, and I'll show you the results there. And this is a Narragansett Bay study, because I figured you guys would be interested in this Narragansett Bay study. The y-axis is the number of microplastics per 100 grams of sediment. Sometimes it's reported in kilograms, but this is, keep in mind, this is 100 grams of sediment. And the x-axis is the um, a north to south transect going from Providence, which is station one, um, to the mouth of the bay, which is station seven. You can see that there's no north to south pattern here and that we also have a variety of polymers that were here. You can also see that the average number that was found of um, microplastics per 100 grams ranges from 40 to about 4.6 million. But really what sticks out is this giant 4.6 million <laughs> peak right there at station four, which is um, off of Newport. And uh, this is 4.6 million cellulose acetate fibers. Um, I put up this picture of these cellulose acetate fibers so you could see them. They were uh, clear, they were brittle, um, 
There are about five microns in diameter, and the length was from like about 300 to about 500 microns. They formed a mat, there were so many, they formed a mat across the filter, and so that's what this is what you're looking at now, is this mat across the filter. And those little bundles, if you touch them, they would break apart with the tweezers. So they're really fun to work with. <laughs> and um, this is what it looked like before uh, Michaela had to dilute these like sixfold in order so we could filter them back out and count them. Um, so we talked a long time about what these cellulose acetate fibers could be, and we really don't have a source of these. We were speculating before that they could be some kind of boating material because there's a lot of recreational boating off of Narragansett. But talking with Martin here at the break, he says, no, they don't use that. <laughs> they don't use that in boating because they need something with more strength, tensile strength, cellulose acetate cells tends to fall apart. So we really don't have a source of these, but we have also seen these in our other regional sediments, and I'll point them out when, we, when I talk about those. So, um, so we, while we don't have a source, uh, we will say that these numbers, and particularly this 4.6 million, most likely underrepresents the amount of microplastics in Narragansett Bay. And this is largely due to our spiked microplastic uh, recovery. So we get about maybe 70, 80% back, but that's still a 20, 20 30% undercount, except for fibers where we get about 45% back. So you're looking at about 55% greater than this. And that is, I think, anytime you work with a really complicated matrix where you have to sieve it, and little fibers go through, that stand on their heads and go through those little sieves, that's kind of really what, what we have found. So other regional sediments that we've worked, we've worked with, um, on the right-hand side of the slide are the different regions. Region one is what I just showed you from Narragansett Bay without the cellulose acetate fibers. Region two, um, is New York, New Jersey, and um, that count is also without the cellulose acetate fibers. Region three is uh, New York, sorry, is um, Maryland, Delaware, and region nine is California. So you can see that the average uh, microplastic abundance ranges from about 50 to about 140 uh, microplastic pieces per, again, 100 grams of wet weight sediment. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see that there's a variety of polymers that we found. Uh, we pulled out the cellulose acetate signal here so you could see the rest of the polymers because uh, it really swamped them. Uh, polypropylene, polyester, polyethylene, um, polystyrene are all the, 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 the major ones we found. And then, of course, we found a number of other types of polymers, uh, which is typical of what you find in sediments. It, the sediments really tend to uh, serve as a sink for all of these um, plastics that end up in there. So um, in region two, um, we also found about uh, four to six million of these cellulose acetate fibers. Surprisingly enough, uh, New York, New Jersey Harbor has a recreational area and they have a national wildlife refuge right at the base of, uh, of Manhattan in the Jamaica Bay. And there is recreational boating there as well, um, but we again can only speculate where these fibers would come from. And they were the same type, the same brittleness, the same uh, shape, and everything else like that. And again, we have to say that this mostly, uh, most likely underrepresents microplastics um, that are present. So for our sediment conclusions from our regional sediments, and we've also done, Troy has done some samples from uh, Maine and New Hampshire as part of the National Coastal Condition Assessment, what we can generally conclude is that microplastics are generally undercounted in sediments that um, this, based on our spikes uh, sediment recovery, and particularly for fibers, we're only probably getting about 50% of those back because of the, uh, the, the extraction methods that they have to undergo. In addition, our cutoff for looking at particle size is about 45 microns. Uh, so we look for, at particles from 1,000 microns to 45 microns. So there is no reason to think that there are no fibers, no microplastic particles at 40 microns or 30 microns. And um, based upon the literature and what Scott said earlier, that the smaller the size range, the number of microplastics increase logarithmically. So there would only be more at those, at those smaller sizes that we aren't counting. We do believe that our methods are generally effective. We can get particle counts and um, polymer size, and we can characterize color, shape, and color and shape. But we could use some more improvement. We recognize that we need to improve the efficiency of our extraction method. And we're working with uh, NIST and uh, Jennifer Lynch out at University of Hawaii to maybe pull a vacuum across the top of our, uh, of our separatory funnels and maybe drop out some of that really interfering organic um, stuff that comes out with sediment. Um, in addition, uh, in terms of time, this is very, very time consuming. Um, 
our identification methodology is accurate in the study that um, Scott showed and then also the study that Troy did. Uh, we found that once the particle is extracted and you can get Raman and FTI or, and, and or FTI identification that we really found uh, over 95% efficient accuracy in terms of, of how those instruments uh, identify the particles. But it's time consuming, we recognize that, it takes a while. Um, there is new automated instrument com uh, coming, instrumentation coming. Uh, our Cincinnati lab has an LDIR that can look at hundreds of particles in really just like a couple of hours, which is really fabulous. And we hope that this instrumentation becomes a little bit more widespread and maybe a little less expensive so that uh, more of us can get it. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of our other regional projects in terms of methodology uh, for water and for sediment. So this is um, standardization of water methods via uh, ASTM. And Anna Marie Cook out in Region 9 did this really hard work um, before she retired. I'm sorry that she left. Um, but she put, pushed two standard practices through, one for the collection of and the other for the preparation of water samples with um, different amounts of suspended solids. And sh this method has been approved for uh, a number of different waters, drinking water, surface water, wastewater, effluent, influent, and marine waters. And uh, she did the really hard work of pushing these two standards through sub, uh, ASTM subcommittee. And if you haven't done that, that is no small feat. Um, I'd like to give a little nod to citizen science because we recognize that citizen science plays an important part in, in plastics. And uh, we always think of citizen science when we think of methods like, isn't there an easier way? And we believe that citizen science technology should be low tech, low cost, and high speed. And we recognize that none of our sediment methods really are. Um, and so we've done some work with the hot needle method, and for those of you who aren't familiar with, you, with it, I know that you guys are over at URI, but it is exactly what it sounds like. You take a hot needle or a heated piece of metal and you hold it close to a plastic particle, usually fairly large because um, so you have to be able to touch it, and depending on how the particle reacts, you classify that as, characterize it as is it a plastic or is it not a plastic. Um, We've done some standardization and validation of this method. Sandy Robinson in our lab has done some step-by-step -step online instructions and some videos, and um, I think that has been submitted this week. So we're, we're happy about that. Uh, we have additional citizen science projects in terms of oxidation and um, looking at, sedi at sediments and, how, and just in terms of uh, getting total plastic concentrations. And we're working, Troy is working on that method now. So, um, I'd like to just uh, talk a little bit about our effects research. Uh, we've done some bivalve blue muscle uptake and then cellular and metabolomic effects of nanoplastics. And Bushra Khan at our lab has done this work in conjunction with University of Connecticut and UC Irvine. And that, uh, present that uh, paper should be submitted at the end of the year. And Marissa Giroux um, in our lab has done nanoplastic exposure to neofaunal and bacterial um, benthic communities using genomic endpoints uh, such as e -DNA, eRNA and eDNA. Um, in terms of future directions, our methods, our objectives are to look at methods for smaller size particles because we really believe that the smaller particles are the ones that affect effects and they are the ones that are out there really. Um, they're, they're, they're in higher concentrations. We are moving towards quantifying polymer concentration as like micrograms per gram rather than particle by particle enumeration. For a number of reasons, um, this is the way that regulatory agencies look at all the other contaminants, and it would be useful if we could look at plastics the same way or start to think about plastics the same way. We will be using um, pyrolysis GC mass spec to do that, and um, pyrolysis GC mass spec can give us polymer identification. It can look at the smaller fraction, it can look at nanoplastics, and it can be faster once you get your workflow going. Uh, in uh, this year, we'll start looking at human health and ecological effects this, um, next, this coming year. And also look at, it says biodegradable, but really, but these should be bio-based plast um, bio plastics. Um, I want to say that uh, to deal with a large problem like small microplastics, it really takes a village, and these are a number of our collaborations. I won't go through all of them, but if people have specific questions about any of them, I'd be happy to talk to them about it. And I want to say that I have just touched on um, so the projects that are ongoing at EPA. Uh, you at the Office of Water has a really active citizen science engagement program across all 50 states. Um, they work on things from uh, 
things like putting in water bottles, water bottle filling stations to best practices for local and municipal officials. They have put together a roadmap for how the government, government agencies can look at microfiber research. Um, and there are projects ranging for, that include uh, sustainable uh, circular economy and um, best ways of uh, recycling and keeping plastics out of our trash. So with that, I think I don't have time for questions now, but I guess I'll take questions later. So a lot of the methodology that we've looked at today from these great speakers 
uh, really highlights uh, the, the reason we go through all these steps because, is because it's just so hard to tell them apart from everything else. We have to go through these steps. It's like a forensic for the marine, for the marine science sector. So we've probably all seen images like this in the media uh, where we see animals are ingesting uh, particles. This is a uh, plankton uh, consumer, this is a copepod, so it's microscopic in size. And you can see it's got these bright uh, circular beads here. So this is a very effective image because it shows to us that these bright plastic beads have been ingested and they're, and they're passing along the digestive tract of this animal. But it's something to highlight here is something that uh, some of us have spoken about today already, is how we have this kind of separation in terms of what's been conducted in the labs in general uh, and what's been conducted and uh, um, relating that to what's happening in the field. So these are perfectly spherical beads. They're consistent in size. They're available from like um, lab-grade factories. And they illuminesce very well, as you can see from this image here. It makes it very convenient and easy to find them. So there's many labs have used these types of beads in their studies because they're very um, convenient to work with, but they don't represent very well what is actually in the field. So we'll talk a little bit more about this, and I know um, Scott spoke a little bit about this earlier. But as these particles are passing along the digestive tract, this is a harmed particle. It could be potentially causing physical harm to those organisms. So this is damage that animals are potentially having to allocate energy to repair. We also may have those particles being retained and stuck along the digestive tract, so that's going to be uh, suppressing nutrition reaching that animal. But the challenge, the, the challenge is there is a huge diversity of, material, uh, of, of organisms out there that we need to sample and identify in terms of the presence of plastics. But we don't really have a very good understanding about um, what, that, the, what the passage of the particles going through the body looks like, how long are those particles in the body for how much of it is ejected by the animal across the other side of the digestive tract. And we don't have a very good picture of what that looks like for the different range of types of shapes and sizes of plastics that are out there. So we do have some major knowledge gaps remaining. So there's the physical damage potential. Um, and here, while I'm meant to be talking about microplastics, we have a, a macro plastic here. We've got a plastic bag wrapped around a Pacific coral here. Uh, but what this illustrates from a uh, Zeppelin and Lamb study is that plastics can sometimes act as a vector for pathogens, harmful pathogens which are forming on that biofilm on their surface. So in this particular case, they talk about Vibrio. So some of you may have heard about Vibrio being harmful to marine organisms. And it's in this particular case, as the bag uh, causes damage to the surface skin of the coral, it exposes that pathogen to the coral and infects it and it causes white syndrome for these corals, and this can be devastating for them, absolutely fatal. And their chances of this, uh, it contracting this disease increases up to 90% when we have this entanglement with infected uh, plastics. We don't have a huge amount of information about this, and this is something that we need to learn more about, especially when we think about our shellfish industry here in Rhode Island. This is a major industry for us, and the Vibrio is something that is already concerned with climate change, which so some of the things that we are examining in our studies here in Rhode Island and in the University of Rhode Island. And as Chris mentioned before, this, the likelihood of this is fairly low, but it's still um, a, you know, an underlying concern and is the chemical risk that these plastics have as well. So amongst those materials building on the surface of the plastic, uh, we have these um, existing organic pollutants which could uh, build on the surfaces there. And we're particularly concerned about PCBs because these have a very long life in, in, in the ocean, and we know they can pass up very easily and build up across the food chain uh, and are very harmful to marine animals. Um, so these are some of the things that we're examining a little bit more closely to try and understand and identify and address these knowledge gaps that we have to improve uh, a lot of these models that I was talking about earlier. So we know plastics are everywhere, uh, and we know they're commonly found in marine organisms pretty much uh, across the uh, Across the world, international efforts to identify the presence of plastics in marine organisms in our oceans, I would say at least about 50 to 60 percent of the organisms we've sampled so far have shown the presence of plastics in their bodies. So it's pervasive there. So it's not a case of whether the plastics are there or whether the animals are interacting with them, but the question really remains of what, uh, you know, what are those impacts? What is the extent of that impact on the, on the marine animals, if any? Um, and how do they travel through the food web? So let's look at this question a little bit more. What is our current understanding of impacts of uh, impact microplastics on marine organisms? So 
again, Scott touched on this a little bit uh, in terms of what we do understand, but it's still fairly limited because we have this mismatch between uh, early lab studies where they've used extraordinarily high concentrations of plastics, which have been very, uh, had a very narrow focus on the types of materials that they've used. Uh, and we need to better align that with what's happening in our environment if we are to have any way of improving the data that's being created to help with our predictive capabilities and our management decisions. Uh, so we need to better align that. This is, this is what we're working with uh, here at the University of Rhode Island. We're working in using more environmentally ballistic <coughs> materials uh, and also concentrations so that we can get a better handle on what that looks like. And this study by Amy Lusher and her colleagues in 2013 gives a nice kind of like illustration about uh, what we're generally finding inside marine animals. It's very sort of uh, generalised, but what they're highlighting is uh, the majority of what we find in material, uh, of materials found inside organisms are fibres. Uh, so this is something that we're taking into account in our studies, is using these fibres. But working with fibres in a lab laboratory controlled aquarium environment is extraordinarily challenging because they're tiny, so we've, we've talked all about that today already, they're tiny. We are all a walking contamination disaster with our clothing. Uh, so uh, as, as, data, as, as Andy Davis mentioned before, we have gone through um, improving, we've gone through a lot of um, startup money and infrastructure improvements to make sure that our working environment is as clean as possible. So we've got air extractors, we've got controlled clothing, these beautiful orange lab coats uh, that, that Andy showed in his images before. Uh, even orange face masks when, when we are having to wear face masks indoors. Uh, and a routine control um, sampling and regular cleaning. Uh, and I would say the amount of controls, which is uh, control samples that we collect, which are the uh, samples which don't even contain our samples, like what kind of contamination we've got in our, in, our sample, in, our, in our workflow, in our work environment, they create the highest amount of workload for us because we're collecting so many background levels to make sure that we're conducting this work in as clean conditions as possible. So uh, this allows us then to have better confidence in terms of working with fibers as a, a material focus in our research. So as Andrew mentioned before, uh, he, he kind of covered, he covered all the kind of extensive uh, field sampling that we're doing in the Narragansett Bay area. Uh, so we're kind of like focusing more on the animal impacts. Uh, and one of the animals that I work with as a model species is sea urchin. So has anyone, seen a, has, has anyone not seen a sea urchin before? Awesome. Some of you probably stood on it on holiday. Uh, anyone eaten sea urchin? Well, you're in California, you wouldn't eat sea urchin. No, you can raise that point, that's fine. <laughs> so uh, inside the urchin, you've got these like bright orange um, five um, row lobes that are edible. You can have them sushi, it's delicious. Um, but uh, I work with sea urchins because they're very, uh, they're very easy to work with, but it's mostly about where they're found in the ocean. So the species that we're working with uh, reside on the seabed. And as Kay mentioned before, the seabed is the eventual fate for the majority of plastics which enter our ocean. So this is a major sink, a major area of uh, that's receiving this like rain of plastics coming to the sediments. So it means that animals that are living in these areas are at high risk because they are intercepting and experiencing those um, increasing loads of plastics. So with the sea urchin, as you can see from this uh, gif here, it has these uh, calcareous teeth, these fiber plates, they open up and then they scrape the seabed and then pull the food item into its stomach. So it's not selective, it's bringing everything in with it. And there's been studies that show that plastics are present, uh, present in sea urchins. So using this model species, uh, I was interested to ask a question about whether we see uh, similarities across uh, the species, uh, uh, different species, in terms of how they respond to uh, microplastic ingestion. And the reason I'm asking this is because quite often when it comes to management, we tend to generalize results and data. Uh, and uh, climate change research has shown us that that's maybe not a, a very appropriate um, approach to take because we do see uh, species-specific responses to uh, these anthropogenic changes. So in this study, uh, this is a work I did in the UK, uh, we took two European species, and they have fairly similar feeding habits. Uh, sea urchins are generally what we call omnivorous. So it means they feed on a wide range of animal and plant matter on the seabed. Uh, but they differ very slightly on their preference for their diet. So on, on, on the left hand, we have a strong omnivore. So it has a very broad range of 
soft macroalgae particles that it eats, and also hard dietary components like small shell, skeleton that comes in from it consuming invertebrates. So it's got some experience of, of, of handling and processing hard dietary uh, components. This other species here has, much, uh, has a much stronger preference for soft macroalgae materials, so it has a stronger preference for this more like herbivorous kind of food intake. So we created this uh, artificial diet that was laced with these highly weathered, so they were irregular shaped 50 micrometer PVC particles, uh, and we included that in this diet at 0.2% inclusions. So it's well within the kind of sediment concentrations that we would find in the natural environment. And fed these animals for up to about three months on this diet. And this is a timeline that's long enough to see any kind of like um, sensitivity or, or changes uh, through dietary intake. And we did. And what was interesting was we saw that our, the animal that had the preference for these softer algae food were much more sensitive to the ingestion of microplastics we saw indications that its nutrition was compromised. So what this tells us that, uh, is that we can see a uh, feeding habit could be a kind of potential sensitivity indicator. Uh, so in this case, you know, an animal that prefers softer dietary intake uh, could be more sensitive to microplastic ingestion. We have a bit more work to do to kind of confirm that with other species, but we thought that's kind of interesting because uh, you know, a, a lot of us are trying to identify uh, bioindicating species, species that can indicate when, a, uh, when the area changes to a point uh, that we can measure that change, um, uh, which indicates whether we need to make severe intervention or management. So another component of what we do uh, is working with uh, oysters, the eastern oyster, Virginia, uh, the Austria virginica, and we are looking at uh, polyester fibres which is typically shed from clothing, which Martin was speaking about earlier today. And we're exposing um, oysters to an increased concentration gradient of polyester fibres uh, to understand how they make, if at all, respond to fibres that may be found in the marine environment. And we were interested to kind of like mix that up with PCBs as well, to see if PCBs may increase their sensitivity to microplastic ingestion. And another component is to look at whether oysters that are ingested fibres can be transferred across the food web. So Hannah Haskell is a graduate student who recently passed her masters, uh, who led the initial steps of us looking at oyster exposure to uh, sorry uh, microplastic exposure to oysters. Um, so she used these um, these polyester fibres which we got from Martin Bide's contact in the textiles industry. So thank you to your contact, Martin. Um, and the, these were about 600, 663 micrometers in length and 18 micrometers in width. And we kind of used a range, so we had zero as our controls. So we had tanks that had no plastics in them, highly filtered seawater. Um, and we were, um, again, we had this like controlled clean lab that we created to make sure that we reduced um, contamination. Uh, and then we had an environmentally relevant concentration of two fibers per litre. Uh, we used a higher concentration that we reported for the field in seawater of up to 95 fibers. So we're kind of looking at a bit of an increasing range here. And then we've got something that looks pretty crazy uh, in terms of its, of its concentration of 950 fibers per litre. So we have this really high level here um, for basically comparative reasons because a lot of literature out there is using very high concentrations like this or higher. Uh, so we needed something that could allow us to have some comparison across the literature to see how we, these outcomes are responding compared to other studies. So we kind of fed these, um, exposed these oysters for up to eight weeks uh, to these fibres. And it's actually uh, a rather simple, um, I guess some people might call it a, a dull story, but I see it as a great story where we didn't see any significant impact on the physiology of these oysters when exposed to these fibres. So we measured things like clearance rate, we looked at their energy available for them to support their body, so carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. We looked at how much energy they were using to support their own um, metabolism, and there was uh, no significant differences there, and no significant differences in the survival. So within what we could measure here uh, with our physiology, we didn't see any uh, responses from, the, from these uh, oysters, which is, I see that as good news. So the next step is to, um, is to lace these with PCBs and think about what other kind of concentrations we're going to use now that we've got some like, more data coming from Narragansett Bay. Um, and I've got Amara Poo, who's a new PhD student who's joined my lab, uh, and she's got a toxicology background. Uh, 
Uh, so she's uh, going to be working on that semester. And then the next step is to, um, is to look at the trophic transfer. So on the Bay Campus environment in the University of Rhode Island, we have these wonderful um, high, high replication level, uh, huge music halls and tanks on the Bay Campus. Uh, if anyone's been wandering around the Bay Campus, you've probably have seen these uh, within a fenced area. Uh, so Sarah Davies, another PhD student who uh, Andrew mentioned before in our team, uh, she's leading this effort and she's been uh, doing some pilot trials with blue crabs, uh, who are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty tough uh, to work with, and um, and we're going to be looking at uh, lacing uh, or providing fibres to these oysters and then feeding those to the crab to see how how those fibres are transferring across to the crab and looking at how long these particles take to pass through the crab. It sounds like very simple steps, but it's simple information like this, like how long does something take to pass through an apple, uh, but we still don't have much of an understanding about yet. So we, we're still ask, asking very simple questions to help improve our data output. But the reason I'm kind of highlighting a lot of these students here is because, first of all, we have an absolutely tremendous team. We're very fortunate to have such a great team working with us on this. But also, we are highly dedicated to training a workforce in this field. As we've learned today, uh, there is, uh, it's highly technical, there's been a huge amount of change in terms of how we do microplastic science in the last few years, so it's rapidly changing, and what's happening is training of the workforce is rapidly falling behind. So the University of Rhode Island and our team are highly dedicated to make sure that we are keeping our students up to date with the latest information, approaches and technologies. Uh, so much so that we're creating these grand challenge courses. So we teach a marine plastic pollution course where students are actually um, doing this. They're working in clean, uh, clean lab environments. They're going out there sampling plastics. They're spiking their samples. So they get some that practice and they're becoming more aware of these techniques and challenges that we need to consider when coming into this. And the biggest motivation for that really is because I'm sure some people have shared this uh, difficulty. It's hard to find and recruit people with the experience uh, with microplastics. So, uh, it's, you know, so we're dedicating ourselves to training that workforce moving forward. And otherwise, uh, as Andy mentioned before, I'd like to say thank you to all our great funders, especially C Grant. C Grant's here today. Tracy, hi. Tracy is C Grant, the director there. So you haven't spoken to her, do speak to her. Um, NSF and uh, Rural Other Science and uh, Technology, just to name a few. Uh, and also an extraordinary long list of undergraduates who have interned and supported our research and, uh, lear and learned a lot about practicing and, uh, and applying microplastic uh, techniques. Um, so otherwise, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll look forward to the question session.
there's a variety of different factors to this question. It's not just about what can they must have, right? There is something about the lofty nature of it. In fact, it's still a learning science in terms of how we do these kind of feelings about it. Uh, 
we're going to take one to two more questions and then get a little bit of caffeine in ourselves for the last part of the afternoon. Yeah, another one, Colleen, I think this is for you, but maybe for the group. I'm curious, is it the work that was done by the master student that was showing that the oysters didn't show, kind of, let's just say, changes in their physiology and behavior? I'm curious where the, where the microplasma or the fibers are ending up in the feces or pseudo feces and where they're concentrating it. I mean, it's, just, it's leading to the good oysters that we don't subsequently eat or buy about to be part of some sort of remediation. But I'm just curious where they, where they track through and maybe where do they end up? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so we didn't, we didn't um, sample the feces material, but Hannah did actually sample all the animals uh, and sacrificed a few to uh, using these digestive techniques we talked about to quantify how many fibers she captured in the stomachs. Uh, so she did this after, I believe it was three hours, but I can check that pull off with you, uh, after introducing those fibers. And she found in the highest treatment that there was an elevation of fibers. So they do, they are, as we mentioned,
Uh, and actually, we studied different technologies that help us to refine you know, the, the treatment of wastewater treatment plant. And shout out to my colleagues from the Narragansett Bay Commission for letting us play <laughs> and allow us to test things in the, in the plant bed. Uh, so I got interested in for that, but as a wastewater engineer, or as a waste engineer, <laughs> Uh, I'm always interested about the concept of waste, you know? If we think about it, uh, it doesn't make sense, you know? We spend so much energy creating things, you know? Think about food, we need land, we need fertilizer, we, still, we need machinery to harvest that. Uh, we, need, um, we need to bring the things to whatever they are produced to all the way to the grocery store, then grow. And then what we do, we just throw it and dilute it in the wastewater treatment plant, you know, and there's still energy there. Uh, so if you ask, uh, so I was really fascinated. I mean, there's something that we can do. And if, I think if you ask a, 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 a waste engineer, they will tell you that there are no such a thing as waste, uh, which is interesting. So what it will be waste, you know, waste is really a resource that is gonna be in the wrong place and in the wrong time. Um, so, and, and why this is gonna happen? I mean, why we have this amount of materials in the wrong place and in the wrong time? And then, uh, well, that was gonna say, you know, so if there is no waste, how do we get to this point and then we start finding microplastics even in the south, in the Antarctica? So, uh, so why did, you know, we were throwing waste so much that it's impacted over almost every single system in the earth? So, hopefully you can see that. So, what I, one of the reasons of why we have this waste is that because we see productions of things or services in this linear way. You know, we use resources uh, to manufacture things, then whatever happened during the use state, and then we dispose it. And each of the stages, we see it as an isolated stage. You know, only the users are focused about the users' issues. The manufacturers are focusing more on the manufacturing issues. So we don't see the interconnectedness between all these different phases, okay? Uh, and that happened, you know, when we make solutions, when we design, you know, solutions, for example, we are, you know, switching plastic bags from paper bags at the, to prevent issues and the end of life. So, but what happened to all the other phases, how the energy and natural resources of the other phases are changing because of the changes of the decisions that we are making. Also, what are gonna be the changes and the impacts at emission in other places? Plastic, uh, paper also is not a very clean industry, you know, and they are usually, most of the paper factories are gonna be placed in vulnerable communities. So we need to think about that. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be using Paper bags. What I'm saying is that we need to see the whole picture of how changes in one state is going to be impacting consumption of resources and emissions in the other phases. So you're going to be. So you hear a lot about the, the, the concept of circular economy or a circular life for plastic materials, and. It's a good idea because in that way we are going to be interconnecting much more all these phases. You know, what happened in one phase because they are connected through materials flow, you know, they are going to feel the changes in the other place. So we are going to have a little bit more interaction between the different stakeholders. What I wanted to say is that uh, we can't forget that this circular economy is going to be part of another system that is, for example, the economic system. You know, when we change, when we create the circular economy, how is it going to be changed in terms, you know, Colleen was mentioning about labor, you know, what is the new workforce development that we are going to be developing, how the supply chain is going to be changing. Also, our circular economy not only is going to be interacting with the economy, but also with society, you know. Uh, who is going to be benefit for this, you know? Who is going to be the one receiving the more benefit uh, for that? Uh, and also, finally, the environment, you know, everything that we are doing, you know, it's going to have eventually an impact in the environment. So as we think about solutions for the plastic problem and developing the circular economy things, we cannot forget that these are, are isolated and they are part of this, all these other systems that we have and they are going to be, you know, impacted. So I think that Rhode Island, you know, we are very well positioned.
position to have uh, to, to create an impact in this case. And I think one of the main um, the main reason that we do it is because we see very clearly the impact of plastic pollution in the coast. You know, it's pretty evident that uh, we see it every time that we go and try to enjoy the beach. So. Very recently at the University of Rhode Island, we created uh, this URI Plastic Collab, which is a collaboratory, meaning that we try to have the centers that they don't have walls. Uh, and we have uh, different researchers collaborating from all the different colleges, pretty much in Rhode Island. And our mission is going to be to accelerate the social impact and how we're going to do it through this collaboration, not only in URI, but with other stakeholders and also through communications. You know, we want to that the information that we are generating get outside uh, to everybody. Uh, we recognize that the problem of the plastic ocean, it originates in at the land. So we need to create initiatives to address the land input of plastics to the ocean. Uh, and we need to uh, try to implement solutions that they are gonna be working on the long term. So our main purpose is to create this network, you know, try to interact with, with all the different players in the community and have the solutions that hopefully we can, you know, foresee in the impact of all these different systems that I was mentioning to you. So we have main five areas of work for this plastic collab. Uh, we have textile, and I think the idea of uh, the, the textile it was an obvious start for us because of the historical connotation that the textile industry has in Rhode Island. Uh, and we have a fantastic uh, textile and merchandise department at URI. Uh, also, we have been interacting with some uh, early stage manufacturers with uh, Kestrel, you know, as our partners for Rob Torgerson is here. He's a, one of the good partners in the, with us in the, in the textile. Also, we are uh, creating tools to, uh, to try to analyze, you know, ceiling. We have really good technologies uh, or equipment that we have been gathering for the analysis of, of plastic and also software that it will help us to understand what are the impacts through the life cycle analysis. We have uh, Colleen and Andy that have been big players and understand how uh, the behavior of, of plastic particles uh, happen and not only in the food chain but also in the environment. And also we work in impacts and solutions uh, for the system. Uh, so what we're trying to do really in the Plastic Collab is bring all this uh, expertise that we have in URI and try to connect it with all these different players and this different system to create this uh, more um, you know, sustainable and long-term solutions. Uh, and all of, something that um, I forgot to mention that we recently got uh, uh, grant from uh, the Department of Commerce that is going to allow us to, to start this initiative and start to create in this partnership with different players. But one of the important uh, activities <coughs> that we're going to have is this uh, global conference at URI in May. Uh, it's mostly in collaboration with the French America uh, Plastic Pollution Research Cohort. Uh, and the idea is going to be try to identify the knowledge gaps that we have uh, on how to um, develop solutions for, for the practice problem. And also we are trying, we look, we are making our list of, of, of you know, attendees. Uh, we already have 45 French lab, uh, US lab, and some of our partners in Ghana too. Uh, so just with that, a very short presentation, I just wanted to invite you to, to go and visit uh, the website of our collaboration. Uh, also, I think URI and the, all the expertise that you've been hearing today, um, they are all willing to collaborate and we are so very interested to take all the, the knowledge that we have outside and helping to, uh, to work with people in the community uh, and in other institutions too. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you and then we're gonna start the interaction. I think. Okay, thank you. So, I think it was right. So this is, sorry folks, this is where we start this collaboration. And so, as uh, Dr. Margaret Everett, the provost of Roger Williams University said before, and uh, Mike Trell, the executive director of Marion Expansion Program said, we're all about convening and collaborating. And so this is not just a research problem, it's not just a management problem, it's not just an advocacy problem, it's an everyone problem. So how do we do this? 
And so I'm going to have both of our lovely microphones with our Roger William University students. They're going to go up and down, along one on each side. And the idea here is to just ask any remaining questions you have. Um, I'll throw one out as the first one to get you guys going while we're getting the uh, microphone set up. And it's, so what next? What topic do you think we need to cover in an upcoming meeting? What people should be at the table? Who was missing today that you wish you would have seen? And we'll use that to start just building off questions. So, all right, so that's it. So let's go. Sorry. All right. All right. So it looks like I'm going to be doing some exercising here too. So first question: Who was missing today that you would like to see?
So I think we've got to join forces with bigger, bigger, with other, uh, with other states. I think we need regional clout.
And also, what is that fingerprint of compounds, you know, that they are in the plastic? Because that is what is going to define the potential reuse of them. And also, you know, how we can dispose of them. We need to dispose of them. So I think that the, the, there is a big void of what is the initial, how is the exact composition, what, they are, what is the information to start with. direction I'm thinking about bands, you know, there are definitely bands in the tool to help us reduce plastic um, entering our oceans. But the one thing that we do need to think more carefully about is having an inclusive conversation with broad, uh, broad range of communities who would be affected by that choice. So there's a paper that I share with my class that discusses this, so I'm using plastic straws as an example. Um, and I'll be happy to share this with the organisers to distribute if they want. Um, forgive me, I can't remember the author's name, but they basically highlight that banning straws can discriminate um, communities with disabilities who are relying on straws to be able to intercept and have their drink. Alternatives are not a solution because they're just not suitable. So for example, a metal straw in a hot drink will get too hot. Paper straws, they will disintegrate quite quickly. So you know, having a conversation and making sure that everyone is having a voice in that conversation so that we can help with a constructive solution for all will be an incredibly important direction to take. Um, I know this was said before, but I think it would be really nice to see a stronger presence of social scientists um, in the room, especially those who are environmental justice practitioners. A lot of people talked about EJ today, but it would be really nice to see some of the people who do that work and who are very skilled in knowledge in EJ work and doing those uh, collaborations with EJ communities to sort of bring some of this research out, you know, outside of this room and into places where it's really needed. I just uh, was thinking, oh, this is not, um, maybe we could do something with some kind of advertising firm on how to get this message out, that we could get some tips on sharing it um, short, sweet, so that the average person understands it, and like, what's the best practices for that? I think everyone has a lot of information. It's just, how do we get all this into one spot um, and get it so people can understand it and find it?
uh, has been done really well with PFAS for like probiotic substances, looking at the cost of inaction and documenting all of the all of the things, all of the ways you potentially uh, 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 PFAS is affecting our society. Everything from staff resources and government agencies to healthcare costs affecting uh, the ability for people to go to work. Um, really, everything has up when you start thinking about all of these different impacts. And I think you can do it pretty easily for a very analytic like key study because we already know from today about the combined sort of sewer overflows and how much it costs to remove, which is trash in that. Uh, uh, trash cleanups, you probably have pretty good accounting for that. Um, and then, you know, you, you could extrapolate or, 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 or uh, estimate the you impacts know, of fisheries, uh, or at least a little framework for understanding the flow of the data. data or something. Uh, I think that would be really useful actually to legislators. I'm, I'm a um, humanist, so I'm going to go back to humanities all the way through the, the hard sciences are needed because I think, for me, I agree with everything everybody's saying, but I think uh, Rhode Island and the region need to figure out what their story is that they want to contribute to and what we do really well because basic research needs funding for the basics, and we've heard that all day today, and we also need it for the communities from the, the people to the producers. But what is it, I think, that this group can think about is what is the story or the dialogue that this area wants to contribute to? And there's great history in that to think about, you know, from textiles that Scott brought up to being on 400 miles of coastline just from Rhode Island alone, that's not included Massachusetts and Maine, and the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. There's some really interesting stories to tell that will bring support here and allow us to fund all of the community-based organizations as well as the deep research. So I think I'm still trying to find the thread that will bring people together to really tell that story. Otherwise, we're just in this overwhelming challenge. Does that make sense? Uh, I'll leave the environment with justice for that. I'd like to know what these affected, um, not just by the sort of microplastics and plastics are, but like by the production, disposal, and recycling of plastics. Like, we're accumulating all the plastics in these gathering it together, but then we're selling it to other states to process. And then there was also like, there were neighbors that come to have an advanced recycling center here in Rhode Island. So I'd really like to hear more about this community's how they're affected by the whole lifespan of plastic.
the amount, all the straws, like it, it's a real, real tiny, tiny fraction, right? And there's much bigger things that the government or the policymakers could be going after that could actually show more immediate results. So basically what ends up happening is you get this thing passed and everyone seems to like uh, revel in it. But, but really what you might be doing is, does, does the benefit really outweigh the, the annoyance that it might be creating? Like you probably have a bunch of irked consumers who are now resenting recycling because they're saying, oh, you took away my straw. When, when really something else probably could have been, you know, just that kind of idea, you know. I think we just opened the big door to this huge economic thing going on. And climate change and plastic waste both exist because we don't, we just look at the cost of digging up the oil. We don't look at the cost of what it does once it's out of the ground. And if we can figure that one out, if we can tax it as it comes out in anticipation of the harm it does, I think a lot of these problems might be ameliorated. to apply what we know to go further. 
And it's not just the space of managers, uh, like the DEMs and DEPs and EPAs of the world, because they need the researchers to help them figure out how to monitor what's going on. But it's also the people. It's the communities. It's all of us saying what's important to us and how can we think through it, not in a way of banning, but how can we do so in a way that's collaborative. So we're thinking of having talks with industrial and, and fiber and textile industry and saying, what can be done? How can we get creative and solve these problems? We can walk through each step. And it's really because of the power of this group and building this co-lab, not just to have a collaboration of laboratories, but just a collaboration of people. And so stepping into that space of conveners, that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep this conversation going. The output of this event is going to be an executive summary. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to watch this recording. I'm going to try and do my best to take everything that's been thrown at us all day and distill down to about five pages with a one-page cover sheet that our advocates could take out and say, like, this is what plastic is in our region. This is what makes it important. But that's not the end of the story because we want to keep moving that forward and have these level conversations. They may be in person, they may be virtual, they may be in any space that makes sense for that conversation. So if we want to have more educators in the room, well, we might just have to go to the educators' meetings because, you know what, it's a school day. Um, if we want more people from the community level, again, during business day, it might not be the best. This might be us going to someone's you know, community center meeting on a Friday night over pizza and just saying, hey, what's up? What do you guys want to do? Because again, it's all of us collectively moving together. So with that, I am going to thank once again uh, the sponsors for this. I have to thank Roger Williams University for hosting the event. Special shout out to Heidi and her team. Uh, all the food, the logistics, getting new people here, the directions, all this stems from the fact that they have an amazing special services that puts on events like this. So they made my life super easy. Um, I have to uh, thank the entire staff in the area to the program, our director Mike Terrell, our outreach and watershed manager uh, Darcy Young, and our data visualization guru Ariel Sorlin, because they basically backed me up on every step of the way and made sure I did not fall flat on my face today. Um, and then I have to thank uh, EPA, they are our prime funding source, and so most of the money that brought you all here kind of came from the EPA, so thank your local EPA person. And thank your congressman, because they gave us that money. And then finally, the Rhode Island um, Water Resources Center, headed up by Dr. Graver here, because they sponsored uh, Honorary to Travel to bring some more super awesome people who are not locals to this region, to the region, and also pay our wonderful speakers a little bit of an engagement fee for us to drain their brains for the entire day. So with that, do not forget, it's still a beautiful afternoon now. We got a little maybe an hour and a half of sunshine left. That trash trailer is still going to be out in the parking lot. So go take a look, go chat with your favorite person, or just find your favorite place to relax because it's Friday and